we are back here and uh, the focus of this panel discussion is leveraging communications and outreach across facilities. And we do have a, another great group of panelists here. Um, we're gonna be starting off with Lars uh, Lin Lindbergh uh, Christensen, uh, who is the head of communications at NSF uh, Noir Lab. You heard from Lars a little bit earlier. Uh, and then we are going to hear from Amy Oliver uh, from the NRAO um, Alma uh, facilities and Jill Molusky, from, who is the public information officer from Green Bank Observatory. And then Ray Villard, who is with the Hubble News uh, Chief. Uh, he is the Hubble News Chief and space tele, at the Space uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in John Hopkins University. And then we have uh, Marty Lachance, who is the Communications Manager from the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure uh, Facility. And then we're going to have our OPA uh, person here, uh, Cassie Eckner, who is the public affairs specialist at OPA that will wrap things up for this session. Uh, this is going to be a big session. We have a, a lot of great uh, uh, presenters, a lot of great information to share. Uh, and so I will work to really try to keep us on time so that we don't, uh, don't run over. Uh, so Lars, uh, you're up first. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to talk about big science, big collaborations, big communication, and I will speed a bit through. I'm scared of Alexa, who has the big uh, stop card there in the back. So um, to remind everyone, uh, NSF's Noir Lab is this new science organization that combines all of the ground-based optical observatories and we have our infrastructures on four summits and one data center, Kid Peak, Gemini, Serotololo, and the new amazing Rubin Observatory. We are in Chile, in Arizona, and in Hawaii, and then of course in cyberspace with our data services all around the globe. Now, astronomy is changing. What's well, not changing, I should ask, but astronomy is definitely changing. Up until like uh, the mid 20th century, we had a very kind of visual view of the world around us. We observed with optical telescopes that originated in 16, nine or 10 uh, with Galileo's observations of the night sky for the first time and had a very you know simplistic view of the world around us. And then suddenly around the 1950s, the radio observation started and we get this multi wavelength view of the world around us, opening a totally new window on things. We realize it's not just stars and dust and planets. No, it's also black holes, things that radiate in all these magnificent wavelengths that we couldn't see before. So we're getting a more complete picture of the physics and everyone is happy and excited sending up probes to study uh, in x-rays, etc. Slowly it creeps in the realization that things move and are actually observable on a time scale which is uh, possible in sort of our human life span of decades. We can observe the universe in the time domain. We can see of course asteroids or things that go bump in the night like supernovae. This is the birth of the time domain astronomy. And then recently over the past decade or two, we have opened a new window. I was about to say the last window, never say last, right? The multi-messenger uh, domain. We're observing cosmic rays from distant galaxies, black holes that emit these kinds of radiation with their enormous um, uh, activity and energy. And we have neutrinos from the sun, neutrinos from supernovae, and most recently also these gravitational waves, um, which had a, a real sort of come through in around 2017, when we could see the optical um, light from those wrinkles in space time effectively. And with that, combining with the photons, with the visible uh, light, with the X-rays and radio light, we now have an even more complete view of the night sky. But that also has meant profound changes to astronomy in itself. So traveling to the telescopes under the night sky in this kind of slightly romantic uh, uh, way ha has become less and less maybe 
favorite, less and less um, useful because astronomy is done at such a grand scale as it is done at the moment. And of course, COVID has also shifted things in that direction. Uh, it's very much remote observing, things are planned to a meticulous degree so that we can optimize the science that we get with those infrastructures out there. It's becoming big science. So NSF's infrastructures are getting bigger and bigger. Author lists balloon. We have thousands of authors on some of these papers. Magnificent stuff is being done by enormous teams. And then, of course, this has an impact on what we do. And I would be remiss if I didn't show at least one space-based image from Webb, because that's one of the examples of big science, right? What is more, let's say, evocative and to the point of sending up these enormous billion dollar projects doing billion dollar science. Things are getting bigger. Now this has an impact on how we do communication. So we met right before the pandemic at STSCI uh, in 2019 at a communication summit where we talked about time domain astronomy and multi messenger astronomy. This was an NSF funded project called Gemma. And we, um, wrote this best practices paper uh, led by Whitney Clavin and Peter Michaud from uh, Noir Lab. Um, and what I have here is just a few kind of um, highlights from uh, that paper. So what we realized was that the primary communications issues that we have is the many authors and institutions. That's a real challenge for what we do. You need to get proper credit where due, recognize all the stakeholders. Many organizations are involved, leading to multiple press releases at the time of the big story. We have competing teams in some cases, very often doing the same kinds of science. We have a press release in the works right now, fantastic story. Two teams didn't know about each other's work, coming to us from you know two different angles, and we tried to somehow bring it out and bring the science across in a simple way uh, which is what the media need. International collaborations, different culture, different languages, uh, embargoes is always this contentious issue, trying to give journalists an edge so we're not actually competing with them, giving them time to do research, talk to the uh, scientists in advance. Press conferences, things are very often condensed in a time of uh, days or even hours. Social media has to be condensed in hours, otherwise it's old news, it doesn't work, and uh, all of these issues. So what do we do with that? Well, we need to coordinate all the work. We need to have people coordinating, the public info information officers. We need to have common cores with the key messaging, the key science has to be the same. We have to do lots of reviews and iterations and very strict approvals uh, workflows. And just a kind of a, a little uh, pitch for uh, my workflows. I would say that any product that we do within communication and education go through kind of a standardized process of inception, sort of ideas, brainstorming. There's a production phase, you produce your text, your graphics, and then you go through sometimes a quite lengthy uh, approvals workflow. The subject expert needs to approve. You need to ensure the high level stakeholders are involved. And of course, there's some iterative noise back and forth as there should be so that everyone can have influence on the texts and everything. Things then finally get published, everyone's happy and they go home, but it's not over, no, because you need to promote everything that you do. You have to get it out on social media, we use Wikipedia a lot, for instance, for some of our results, has an enormous impact also sort of long term with a very long tail, getting things out in a scientifically correct manner, but also attractive with the imagery, etc. You archive things, you evaluate the success, and then you do the whole thing again, rinse and repeat. And um, the Event Horizon Telescope, I think, is one of the um, examples of how you have these enormous collaborations, enormous tension between these super excited uh, scientists doing fantastic things um, that may lead to a Nobel Prize. They know it, we know it, and everyone's so excited and try to work together. But of course, it creates also a tension field that you have to navigate as communicators. But when it then happens, the results are amazing. This is from the first EHT campaign, which I was involved in. And of course, all these front pages, they you know speak their language. It, it, it's just amazing. Now, um, my last slide, I think, 
highlights what it is that we actually need in those big communication collaborations. So we do need all the facilities projects to have dedicated communicators um, and who can work together and represent the, the facilities. We need to have a common policy with respect to the communication that's ongoing, also with embargoes and media requests. And of course, some need things long in advance, and you need to decide whether or not you can give it to Newsweek or you know National Geographic, which work on timescales of months. Um, a press conference should have no, have no more than five speakers. I guess most of the people in this room here and online would say, yeah, of course. But if you have a result with like EHT, you really have a lot of people who should be there. And press releases are meant to factually explain the main science results, not to highlight the science uh, scientists in the entire team or be complete. You need the scientists to have formal media training. The, the press conference uh, materials need to be vetted and simplified. Social media posts need to be uh, coordinated. And then, of course, media need to be with an open distribution license like Creative Commons and such. Most of this is obvious to the people in the room, but now it's written down, we presented the paper, and I think we can use that also in the tension field as we go forward with all those wonderful uh, scientists out there. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, and, and moving right along, uh, I believe our next person up is Amy Oliver. Yes. So I'm really glad uh, to hear everything that Lars said today um, because <coughs> that's perfect for what I'm going to talk about today is how we execute on these best practices and how they create success for scientists, which is the goal um, for public information. Of course, we want the public to understand their science. So, um, if you ever wonder how science results end up in the news media, it is PIOs, uh, which are public information officers. So as Lars mentioned, we do the writing and we do the promotional work. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that process looks like. Lars showed you the, the, length, the lengthy process. and I'm going to dig down a little bit deeper. So this is what NRAO's geography looks like. Um, we are currently in multiple states, as you can see with the VLBA. We are in also um, Chile. And then with the, uh, excuse me, bring my brain back online. With the oncoming of NGVLA, we may also be in Canada and New Mexi er, Mexico. <clears throat> so... Part of looking at that type of landscape in that geography is to show you that we are leveraging collaboration and cooperation every minute of every day with what we do at NRAO. So it is really in our blood, it's in our DNA. At Alma, there are four PIOs. And so, uh, so we are continuously cooperating with each other um, to make sure that press releases go out in a meaningful way to benefit the greatest number of scientists. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. At NRAO proper, um, this is what our team looks like. You can see that Nay and I both um, come over from Alma into the NRAO uh, group, and I am the public information and news manager over all of public comms for NRAO. So we also have a PIO for the VLA and the VLBA, and then we have a new public information specialist, Tom Gangarich, who will start on October 10th um, for the NGVLA specifically. Um, we also have our own multimedia group, which is very important to the production of press releases, and they also do a significant amount of collaboration with other institutions, and I'll show you a little bit of what they do as well. Um, but public comms is not just press releases, so I think it's really important that as we have this type of conversation about best practices and about how PIOs work, that everyone have a really good understanding of how community engagement um, and education or EPO groups work. Which is we do all of these types of things, and then there are additional educators as well. Um, so to start this conversation, I want to tell you a little story about Alma and get this to work. Okay, so in 2021, there were 483 papers written involving Alma data. That's a lot of papers. But only 25 of them became a press release. 
And that is because it takes time to take all of those steps that Lars showed us in best practices um, to get from writing a press release and then getting it out into the press and then tracking it and analyzing it takes hundreds of hours. Um, particularly when we are also creating illustrations, animations, and processing images. And so we cannot reasonably write about every paper that is ever written. And we'll talk a little bit about how we make those decisions as well. So NRAO wrote 13 of the 25 press releases in 2021 that came out of Alma. So that doesn't mean that's the number of press releases that were written about Alma data. There are also individual institutions um, that also have PIOs who sometimes support their scientists as well. And that's a huge part of collaborative and cooperative work. So it looks really deceptively simple. Um, we get questions quite often about this. Well, I've written a paper, you just write a press release, and then USA Today, you know, Jordan Mendoza just writes a just writes a story about it, but it's really not that simple of a process. Um, we're gonna actually walk through that process in a little bit, but we have to get from this place where we have an abstract that is really beautiful. And as a PIO, when we look at this and we say, okay, this galaxy has some water in it. And we can see that. And as PIOs, we are trained to read for that type of important information, for that type of public friendly, public interest information. And so when scientists look at this, they see something entirely different than we do. The same, but different. And so our job is to then take that and turn it in to something that the public can understand, that they can digest, and they can connect with. And then from there, we always hope that we write a press release that doesn't need too many additional changes um, to support journalists um, like those at USA Today, like Jordan, who are then going to write a lengthy, beautiful story using our images and our words and our, our analogs. So uh, it's also about images. And so in a scientific paper, uh, we collaborate quite often getting that to a public release and into the news to get it from this uh, graphical image, which is significant to the science, to producing these um, very wonderfully processed sky potatoes. Um, that's not a joke. A lot of radio astronomy often starts out looking a little bit like a sky potato, and that's okay, because it tells us something about the universe, about the hidden universe, and we know that. So later we bring our scientists in who combine this, uh, the graphical data with the image processing, um, conversations with the scientists, with other institutions. Uh, they get different data from other telescopes to often create photorealistic visualizations. And that's a really critical part of creating context for the public in that best practice for making it mean something to them. And so that is what, that's that process that they go through right there. Now, why it's so important to collaborate effectively and to go through these, these processes is because we can make things like this happen. So Tony Wong was a scientist at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and, uh, and then he went to California. And so he was in a little bit of limbo at the time that his paper needed to be presented as a press conference at AAS 240. And so NRAO and Alma stepped in at the forefront for him and we took on his press release and prepped him for his press conference. And he was absolutely outstanding. Um, the press officers at both universities were outstanding in supporting us and what we needed to do for him. And we were able to not only get him into his press conference, but achieve 1.4 billion uh, in estimated reach for the media and 425 global media hits. And you can see some of the types of press um, that covered this story. And that's a really big deal. When we're talking about those numbers to the PIOs in the room, that really means something. And to everyone else, maybe not so much. But it's really important, um, if you're familiar with Andrea Dupree um, and when Betelgeuse had that coronal mass ejection-esque um, event, like a sneeze, um, it was about four billion, and that was a really big story. So the type of cooperation that we were able to do for Tony resulted in more than, than a quarter of, of similar types of attention in the media, and that's really what we want so that we're reaching out to more people. And 
Tim's going up to the front. Am I over my time? <laughs> Good indicator. Do you think you can wrap up? Is this your last slide, Amy? It is not, but I'll be really fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, um, so anyway, this is what the ESO uh, images looked like, combining data. Um, this is what our images looked like. Uh, what's the process to get there? We have to determine whose story is it so that the right people get credit and lead. Um, who sets those timelines, who has priority. Um, and again, that's really important. You can see the partners who did this other one for Kate Whitaker. And is the result newsworthy? Uh, were we given enough notice to help? Is the science sound? Is a press release the right way to tell that story? <laughs> I'm almost there, Tim, I promise. Uh, did the okay. researcher do I'm something sorry. newer, better, faster, smarter? I told you I could be very fast. Can we make this potato look like a galaxy? The answer is inevitably always yes. And can the result be explained to the public in an accessible way? Would my dad think it's interesting? <laughs> And of course, we do media relations. As Lars already mentioned, we don't want uh, people like Dennis Overby or Ethan Siegel to receive the exact same press release five times. So it's very important for us to work together. I made it. <laughs> Excellent, Amy. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, lots of great uh, information, ideas, and thoughts in this in this panel. Uh, you know, but uh, we are going to try to squeeze a lot into a, a very short period of time until these guys can figure out how to get us close enough to a black hole where we can warp the space time continuum and actually stretch that out. But anyways, so let's go on to Jill. I think uh, Jill's ready to go. Yes, oh, here great. I am. Hey, everybody. Jill? Yeah, apologize. Uh, bandwidth issues. Don't have my camera on so you can't see my lovely face while I'm talking, but very excited to share with you. Um, touching on the processes, the procedures that Lars and Amy introduced and in how they happen at Green Bank. And uh, we're a site with a huge instrument, but we have a bit of a smaller team. So it's always fun to get to work with other facilities because um, it's, it's a great process all the way around and I'll explain why. So next slide, please. So um, a quick whistle stop overview of communications and public information at the Green Bank Observatory. So for some of you who've been in the field for years, um, you might be a little confused about the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, and then the Green Bank Observatory, GBO, and what our relationship and our roles are together. So uh, the Green Bank Telescope, uh, the facility, the site that is in Green Bank, uh, West Virginia, was once a part of NRAO, and it actually divested in 2017. So we actually do still share and overlap a lot of different um, administration areas, and we work together in lots of different ways. We, we are our own organization. So in some ways, that throws a little wrench in the communications works um, that people like Amy and I are working hard uh, together to address when it comes to producing media and communications that comes out of Green Bank. So anyways, our site never had its own public information officer. That happened with the creation of my role and me joining the team in 2019. And similar to that little overview that Amy gave you about what our work looks like, um, besides just producing press releases, I coordinate media requests and visits, um, as you might imagine, with a huge and really interesting instrument like the Green Bank Telescope, there's plenty of reporters and journalists and media reporters from all over the world that would like to come out and produce stories about uh, what this instrument does. Also work on internal and external communications, producing swag, outreach, um, staff and VIP events. So um, all this work at Green Bank, it's unique. It's a one woman shop, essentially. Um, so again, I really love to work with other facilities and teams because that just gives me more people to um, spread the work out and share the work with. We do have a uh, website manager and graphic designer who's able to produce some artwork. But again, it's really great when I get to overlap with NRAO or other facilities that have their own staff dedicated to producing video, animations, other things like that. Um, and again, at our facility looks a little different. Our PIO, myself, we, I report directly to the director. Um, it's not a part of the EPO department like in other facilities, but we work with EPO. And um, we are not a part of our public facing science center, but I support their communications and projects. Next slide. So um, 
what happens if you know people don't realize that we're our own institution and they reach out to NRAO first uh, to ask about doing a press release or sharing a story? Well, my awesome NRAO colleagues pass me that, um, pass me any GBO related material and vice versa. If someone comes into Green Bank looking for NRAO, I had that, hand that over. Um, and we do on occasion issue joint press releases where the work of our scientists, the data that we have, or the work of our instruments overlap. And in current times, this really happens with the work of radar. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about radar and how that uh, has us doing outreach and communications work with even another type of facility out there. Next slide. So a quick way that um, the press release workflow looks here, and person who's controlling my slide, just go ahead and hit the arrow button a whole bunch of times because I have some little animations here that might take a minute to load. So yeah, just keep going all the way through. So much like we saw at other places, except here it's a bit more condensed um, and, and efficient um, because it's a team of one. I'll receive a request. That request might come from a scientist, um, another communications person, another organization um, that could be a university, a science facility, or even private uh, industry. I'll work with the scientist or the person who produced the data to create the text, have that back and forth um, to get it to its final state. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, work with other organizational communication staff that may be involved if the facilities are uh, lucky enough to have them. Um, I'll pass it on to that graphics person I mentioned to produce an image, or we'll see if we have any other content at Green Bank that we can actually repackage, repurpose, or rebrand for this piece. We try to be very efficient with that. Then I issue the release to um, our news contacts, NSF partners, government partners. We have relations with lobbyists. Our Green Bank website, Green Bank social media platforms, our uh, uh, members and science users, we have an e-blast list of about 10,000 users, and then I'll coordinate uh, interviews for the uh, data producers and uh, anything they might want to do on site. Next slide. Um, and again, just uh, some examples of some case studies that we've done where we're partnering with uh, universities or under other organizations. Um, we do a lot with uh, Pulsars and uh, Ultra Wideband, and we work with Nanograv and the Moore Foundation. So here's a little snippet of a press release that we were put out earlier this year where I worked with communication staff with Nanograv and the Moore Foundation, um, along with the subject matter experts, the scientists at Green Bank, and we also had overlap with NREO. Um, didn't have to use a graphic or produce anything new for this. Um, we just use the logos accurately and existing imagery that we had. Um, something I'm really proud of at Green Bank that I put together is our assets are very easy to use and find on our website. Whether I'm putting something together or a partner or a journalist or a media producer wants them, I can point you right to them along with all their attributions and credits. So it makes um, putting out something like this a lot easier. Okay, next slide. Um, and then here's a quick example of a case study where we worked with pr private industry. And this is where we have that great overlap with NREO again and um, work that we're doing with the GBT and radar. So Raytheon Intelligence, private industry has um, DOD contracts, also working with one of their contractors named Corvo. Um, there's a new radar system that we developed for the GBT. The workflow for this was quite intensive because of um, extensive review and approval processes Raytheon required because of their DOD work. Um, the way that this was executed was all through Zoom meetings based on the availability of teams. We had to navigate a lot of information gaps because some of the staff um, didn't have full access or didn't have the full, pic full picture of this work because it did overlap with some, um, some of that DOD work. So it was quite interesting to have to work together and pull this together. Um, and we also had to work around other NSF directives at the time. Some of this news was coming out as um, Arecibo had been damaged and was then closed down. So there's just a lot of different things that we had to juggle to make a um, project like this that involves so many different facilities come out in a timely fashion and meet everybody's goals. Next slide. And I'm aware I'm probably coming up to the end of my time here. I think I only have one slide left. 
Oh yeah, so tools for success. So really quickly, this just echoes so much that Lars and Amy already said, understanding the workflow of other organizations is really key. How long the approvals process, the reviews process might take, um, looking at the time and schedule, we, we mentioned embargoes, um, the length that it will take through the workflow to produce the assets that you need if you don't already have those together. And the most valuable thing I found over the past few years is just establishing a shared workspace, something like Google Suite, if that's okay with your security and your permissions, where you can share all the logos and graphics and official wording you need that's required by your cooperative agreements or your awards. Um, don't make assumptions that you know um, what an organization is, because as I mentioned, there's still a lot of confusion with Green Bank and NRAO, and that's something that we're constantly corrected. And also having a shared workspace allows you to work from one version um, and save a lot of time when it comes to the constant updates and changes that come in text or the messaging that you're putting out. And sorry, that was so condensed and, and all up in there, but I look forward to any questions you all might have at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. And I, I'm just amazed and you know, kind of realizing here that um, as science teams have gotten bigger and more diverse and involving more institutions, it has also evolved the communications and public outreach efforts and how you have to coordinate across facilities and with so many people to actually get a um, get a press release out these days. So I want to thank these folks for their work. Uh, Ray, you are up. Okay, thank you. I just want to say it, it's a pleasure being invited to this. And it's been fun meeting with my colleagues uh, from the other, especially radio folks, and um, it, it's fun to collaborate. Um, let me pull up my slides. I'm going to pivot here. You've heard wonderful presentations about how public affairs, can you all see this? Yep. yep. Okay. Wonderful presentations about how public affairs people do what they do, and, and they were wonderful and very concise. Now, I'm going back to the meeting we had at the Institute uh, three years ago, which Lars mentioned, to talk about multi-messenger and time domain astronomy. I don't want to focus on that because the previous talks got into that. But in the summary from this meeting, in the last sentence, they said it's, uh, it's clear the communications needs of our society and its citizens have changed. And that's really the crux of my presentation. The landscape is really changing dramatically. And, and I've been in this business for decades and it's been quite a change. Um, I've got Jim Carvel up there because if you remember him from Clinton, he said, it's the economy, stupid. Well, it's the story. And regardless of the internet or movies or whatever, it's always the story, which we are crafted to write. As, as explained earlier, you take this abstract and turn it into something people might pay attention to. And a good story is not just about facts and figures, or even who saw what first, although the scientists might argue with that. You have to, you want to get a reader, you have to appeal to their imagination and curiosity. And this is a theme I'm going to keep repeating throughout this talk. And a good story, whether it's science or anything else, needs elements as much as we can find them of challenge, surprise, achievement, and emotion. The emotion of the excitement of scientists discovering something new. Now, Hubble, with its broken mirror, had all of these things. It read out like the Hollywood script. Um, why isn't this working? Wait, wait a minute. Oh, OK. I, I was inspired by this. I found this quote from Stanley Kubrick, who made 2001. He was talking about Arthur Clarke, who co-wrote the screenplay. He said, you know, Clarke had a skill of writing about planets and worlds with the same poignancy as people and children. If we can do that, I think we get the story hooked. So when we do a story, the number one question is, how does it feel feed people's curiosity? And our audience, what, what information are they seeking? And I'm going to come back to this. How are they going to use what we tell them? And how does it tie in with their everyday interests? And also, can you find a much broader cultural context? Now, the quote at the bottom is, we're a tiny species in a majestic universe. So we can use that line all the time. <clears throat> also, which I found with the Webb Telescope, a celebration of American uh, scientific and technological prowess. The trouble, the challenge I have de dealing with some scientists, everybody has a preconception of what they think their neighbor knows, how they think their neighbor knows. In reality, science literacy in the United States is under 30% of the population. People know very few science concepts. And if this were a longer talk, I could give you a whole list of examples. So the first thing I ask in interviews, 
Why should I care? Why should my readers care? And to me, the big thing is, what, what, have we, what have you taught us about the universe we didn't know before? And how can we communicate this without scaring away the readers? And my, my colleagues before me reiterated this nicely. Um, what we do is sometimes antithetical to how scientists think. They write science papers. But we need to trade precision. And precision is not the same as accuracy, let me say. We need to, to trade precision and integrated details and, and, and jargon and, and avoid esoteric topics or find ways to explain those esoteric topics like gravitational waves. Um, but I love this quote, science is a way of making heads turn away. You don't want to lose your audience by just making them feel it's too much to think about. <clears throat> now I'm going to quote a lot of the research from the gentleman to the right, Dr. John Miller, who has followed science literacy for decades. The irony is that Americans have access to more information at lower cost than any time in history. The challenge we face is that when I started with Hubble, science was tightly controlled. Science stories were tightly controlled by uh, seasoned science writers like Dennis Overby, and uh, and so on. Uh, Social media blogging is is the is the wild wild west, and there's good stuff and there's bad stuff, and it, it it's a whole new paradigm shift. With social media, also public attention span has shortened, and to reiterate what, what previous speakers said, you got to keep it simple, visual, and once again, invite curiosity. Now, this is the John Miller model of um, what what percentage of adults are even interested in science. He kinds of splits it down the middle. At the top are decision makers and policy leaders. We'd better keep them informed. They pay the bills. The attentive public has some science literacy, and they really they have the hunger to learn more. Interested public, they like the stuff, but it's got to be visual and it's got to be simple. And based on Miller's studies, only 19% of our public feels they are well informed about issues they may be interested in. Now, for those of you who've seen the, the film The Graduate, that goes back a few decades, there's a great line where this businessman says, there's just one word, one word, plastics. Well, I got one word, salience. And this is from John Miller. Salience, individuals will seek information when they need it or they want it. And how does it fold into their personal interests? The more salience, the more they will pay attention and remember what, um, what we were telling them. The other key thing with salience is curiosity. You know, we're not finding a cure for cancer. We're not uh, solving the energy crisis. But in this Pew study, a big chunk of the public are just want to know what's happening, and especially space, which invites tons of curiosity. It doesn't help with everyday life in that sense. It, it's, it's pure curiosity. And this was an interesting study from Pew as well. What do, what do people think NASA should be doing? And number one is, how do we make Earth a better place, <laughs> which, you, which is kind of a no-brainer. Number two, and I think they've been watching too many disaster movies, how do we save Earth from asteroids? But number three, which I enjoy, the, 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 the value of, of basic scientific research to increase our knowledge of the universe. And note, at the bottom of the list is human space travel. This is from John Miller. There's been a, a paradigm change. Uh, we think of people their brains as a warehouse, I call it the attic, but you, you know, you go to school and, and you pour in all this information. I did this for years as an astronomy, adjunct astronomy teacher. You just pour this information in. That's not the way the world looks, works today. It's the Miller just-in-time model, which is the marketplace metaphor. When I need, I've got only a fixed amount of time, when I really need to learn about something, I'll go to the mall. I mean, if I need a toothbrush, I'll go to the mall and get it. I'll only go to the mall if I need a toothbrush. So they will, that in, there's some information accessible. They will grab that information when they feel they really need to know something about it. Now, dovetail with, with what my previous speaker said. You know, what, what we enjoy, astronomy is much, astronomy is great for grabbing people's imagination, even something as esoteric as black holes. You can't do that with particle physics. I feel sorry for my colleagues. But everybody has seen the nighttime sky, and they have wondered. And astronomy is a preeminently visual science. Now, one astronomer told me that the one spectra is worth a thousand pictures. 
<laughs> go convince your reader of that. Spectra tells us tremendous things. But it, the, the pictures open the door to curiosity. They cannot be overestimated. Now, the Webb telescope is, is half of it is, is spectroscopy, and it will do tremendous discoveries. But you've seen all the pictures from Webb, and people are going nuts. My, my email is flooded. And NASA putting out pictures every day getting blogged. Of course, there are some profound discoveries that are not visual at all, but they get the public excited. Number one is to open my time almost up. One minute. Number one, they get excited about life and this idea that there might be microbes on Venus got people very excited. Gravity waves, the whole new dimension which Lars talked about. Um, Finding exoplanets. Now, the average person doesn't know what a photometric transit is, but they know it's cool that NASA finds planets out there. So, my final slide from a John Miller study, which you and you can look at these slides after the talk. We need to think creatively to attract more people and 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 get their everyday interest. Um, the broadcast model of editing and production it, it is falling aside to everything that's offered on the internet. Um, Miller feels we need we need to focus have a focused programming and significant resources for communicating astronomy to the public and to fold this in forget about agenda setting and, and frankly I would even say messaging but to fold this in to recognizing that space is important in the research in the lives of everyday citizens so that's my gospel when it comes to reaching out to the public Thank you, Ray. Okay. Um, next up, we have um, Marty. All right. I'm going to talk about something quite different. My name is Marty Lachance, and I am the communications manager for the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure. I'm going to talk about engineering. And today, I will talk about our network communications campaigns and how they enable us to provide better focus engagement and impact for our facilities. So let me orient you, we're getting out of space and we're heading to um, large scale engineering laboratories. The NERI network is a mid-scale facility in the NSF Engineering Directorate and we're focused on mitigating damage from earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes and related hazards. The NERI network has 12 network facilities, they're all here in the circle plus a 13th in the planning stage. Our experimental facilities include substantial laboratories such as wind tunnels, large geotechnical centrifuges, and the world's largest outdoor shake table, earthquake simulator. Other major facilities in our network include a cyber infrastructure, a computer modeling, computational modeling facility, a social science center, and the network coordinating office, NCO. Um, that's the administrative component of the award, and that's what houses the communications office. What's NERI about? NERI is about resilience. So we are about, are the researchers in our, in our network, they use our facilities to create a more resilient built environment, structures, a more resilient natural environment, they do coastal engineering, and a more resilient society, because that's what it all boils down to, isn't it? So NERI Communications functions as a kind of glue, ensuring coherence and consistency throughout the network. Our staff consists of a communications manager, that's me, and a small part-time staff. And our charge is promoting high-impact research projects at all our facilities, disseminating details on facility trainings and lectures, disseminating details on educational efforts from K-12 through the graduate level, and informing the public about network efforts, efforts to re achieve a more resilient world. Now, as well as raising public awareness about engineering research, our communications goals are also practical. We want to recruit, increase researcher inquiries to NERI facilities. We want people to come to our facilities. So we're looking for inquiries about new NSF research proposals, about facility collaborations, and about events. So 
Full featured is how I would describe our communications toolkit. It's um, on a smaller scale than you've seen in the earlier presentations, but we generate email blasts and newsletters. We have a newsroom where we publish blurbs, features, news releases. We produce the Design Safe Radio podcast. We have a regularly updated website, and we have a very strong social media presence. Additionally, our conference. Uh, with our conference booth, we present at three to five meetings each year. So we have a very large network, a very small team, and a strong communications toolkit. So we asked ourselves, how can NERI Communications focus its activities for maximum impact? We adopted the strategy of focused communications campaigns. Each campaign is a collection of promotional activities concentrated on a specific facility. They are rolling two to six month uh, promotional efforts, and we cover three to four facilities concurrently. The advantages of this strategy include these material benefits. We can do better communications planning this way. We have really good focus for each facility. We have a manageable, manageable number of communications uh, activities at any given time. We get much greater online engagement. And we have a better ability to measure tangible impact inquiries to NERI facilities about new NSF projects, collaborations, and events. Our campaigns provide perceptible value to the general public and to the field of engineering, as well as to students considering college majors. In particular, the NERI facility at UC Davis boasts large-scale centrifuges that geotechnical engineers use to test soil-to-structure interactions. In this campaign, we aim to exhibit how centrifuge research contributes to resilience. It's not obvious. We published three podcast episodes featuring the site, earning, now this is going to sound sad compared to the billions that you guys were hearing about for NRAO, but um, uh, 500 downloads and 12,000 social media views, which was an excellent, uh, really excellent exposure for this facility. Our site PI stressed that Design Safe Radio podcast episodes, quote, helped educate a broader audience and attract students to our discipline of geotechnical engineering. Now, NERI at UC San Diego is home to the world's biggest outdoor shake table. The facility recently completed a major renovation and its first experiment is a full-scale, 10-story wood building to demonstrate the resilience of tall wood buildings. Aptly, it's called tall wood. The campaign is ongoing, but in the first phase, our seven promotional activities earned a significant number of 4,000 online views and 8,000 potential views from attendees at, fall, at the Fall AGU conference. We also collaborated with UC San Diego and the tall wood teams. Uh, the attention-getting and dramatic result, UC San Diego and the Tallwood teams had media inquiries from Popular Mechanics, The Wall Street Journal, PBS TV, The Discovery Channel, and just last week, uh, the UC San Diego Earthquake Simulator was featured on Bill Nye's new show, The End is Nigh, on the Peacock Network. Uh, the footage uh, of the shake table appeared in the sixth episode focused on quakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, and graphically illustrated how researchers make buildings and infrastructure more resilient. So both of these campaigns would enable the, the public to understand and appreciate the benefit of NSF-funded research in natural hazards engineering. Such appreciation is fostered by our NCO communications campaigns, which also result in high value for our network facilities and the NERI researchers working at them. In the following examples, the facilities enjoyed a rise in researcher interest, and this is really key for us. The NERI Lehigh facility excels in a highly specialized type of testing called hybrid simulation. The fellow there is standing uh, next, to a, um, next to a shake table, actually. The facility recently added an earthquake simulator in the, in the image and several test beds. In this campaign to promote the expanded facility, we published three articles, made multi multiple social media posts, and garnered about 2,000 views. The result? Four new research teams contacted the Lehigh PI, inquiring about using their facility. Now, that's just what we want. That's just what we're looking for. Also, three research faculty contacted the 
uh, principal investigator to introduce themselves and inquire about attending Lehigh's annual workshop. In this short time frame, seven requests for information. That is an unexpectedly high number of cold inquiries for this one experimental facility. Now, the Mary Sim Center constitutes the network's modeling and simulation facility and is a fine example of NCO communications drumming up documentable interest in NERI facilities. The NERI Sim Center team does a lot of training with its software on its software tools, such as the live expert tips sessions. In this campaign, our office conducted 19 promotional activities for live expert tips, which garnered more than 4,000 views. And the tangible value for the Sim Center, nearly 40% of their event registrants came from the NCO's promotional effort. Marty, can can we go ahead and can wrap up here? Um, yep. Because we're down to about five minutes. Okay, okay. We still need to have Cassie go. Thank you very much. You can see our lessons learned. You can download them after the session. All right. Thank you, Marty. Okay. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. Great ideas. So, Cassie, we will have you wrap things up. Come on up here. Hello and good morning, everybody. If you have questions during my presentation, I want to encourage you to go ahead and ask questions. Um, I work for National Science Foundation in their public affairs, media affairs branch, and we get a lot of questions from facilities. So again, feel free to interrupt me. So since we're almost at lunchtime, I'm gonna go ahead and give you some tasks. Who here thinks it's important to let taxpayers know how we're spending their money? Anybody? All right. I see almost everyone's hands. Um, what about inspiring the next generation of scientists and researchers and support staff to fill your shoes? All right. Awesome. And what about informing the public, informing and inspire them so they can have an understanding of science and what we're doing? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Okay. So there are a number of different ways that we can go about doing that. And in the spirit of time, I'm going to talk a little bit about media because media can actually hit all three of those objectives. So one of the ways that we at NSF and our facilities work with media is pitching content to media. But what do we need to pitch to media? We need your help. We cannot do it alone. We need support from managers, we need support from directors, and we need support from scientists. So we pitch things like compelling images. Think what you would see on the front page of a major newspaper. We also can pitch exciting findings and stories, whether it's through your research or something exciting that's happening at your laboratory um, or facility. Um, resources. So when we have interesting things happening like an eclipse, we can pitch people or facilities assets or research and get, um, get those elements out into the news. And then also something unusual or a first, and my personal favorite, we like to pitch our people. So you are an amazing conduit to the community and it's great to be able to put a face to the scientific research um, that NSF is enabling and that your facilities and researchers are actually doing. Another way that we get the media's attention is through a press release. And that is essentially, and I'm summarizing it, a story that provides information to the press. So it's, as Amy mentioned, it's not a scientific paper. It's written in everyday language, not scientists. So we want to keep things in press releases short, concise, timely, and to the point. Um, excuse me, and to the point. And the next is timely. If we don't get the information until a day after it comes out or that you release your paper, then it will be old news. So we need to work hand in hand with you in the very beginning, as soon as you know you're going to potentially have some, some newsworthy story to share. Um, so for us to be able to put anything out, for us to have any kind of success or reach those objectives that we talked about in the beginning, we have to work together. So researchers, communicators, support staff, leadership, we need all of you to come together. And we need you to understand that in order to, to get the attention of the press, we need short and simple stories that are impactful. We need concise communication 
and one thing that I do see a lot are a number of quotes because we have so many amazing people at our facilities and so many amazing collabor collaborators. We want everybody to have a quote, but the media doesn't necessarily like that. So again, when you do put in quotes, put in content that is extremely powerful, impactful, or something that they can't get anywhere else. And then always, always, always identify your key messages and communicate early to us and, um, at our facilities staff uh, early so that we can have those uh, messages out and all of the content ready for news agencies when the time comes to release the information. Um, all right, I think I'm barely there. So I try to consolidate everything. Um, but at NSF, we're here, we want your stories and we're here to help. So at any point, if you want to reach out to us, media at nsf.gov. Um, we also have a number of other um, places that we can place your content potentially that Corey mentioned earlier this morning. We have amazing creative services staff. We look forward to collaborating with you and our facilities in the future. And I think that's time, so I don't want to go over, but thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Cassie. And uh, this panel did something that was I thought was impossible, which was to finish on time before lunch. And so I, I do owe all of you a beverage of your choice one day. So <laughs> thank you all very, very much. Uh, we probably do have time for one question just before uh, we do break for lunch, if there's if there's one out here in the audience or... In the in the spirit of everybody here talking about how to coordinate and collaborate and people making connections, like the the Green Bank person said, um, can we have all of the communications professionals here that represent some kind of large facility come up and all meet together so that we all get each other's cards and know each other, and that way we can all talk. Maybe we could even organize like a regular meeting so that we're all talking to each other. There could be themes for the media folks so that we can all be coordinated. What do we think? <laughs> okay, so I believe you're going to go ahead and sit first at the table and then everybody else will gather around you. Okay, excellent. excellent. All right, well, thanks again. Uh, we will be back uh, right after lunch for the, uh, for the next panel. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Enjoy your lunch.